Okay, good morning, everyone. This is the Vermont House Committee on Commerce and Economic Development. Um, it is Wednesday, uh, March 16th at 9.05 in the morning. Um, we are here to look at 570, um, just for everyone's uh, knowledge, 570 is a short form bill, so there's really no language in it. But we're here to discuss the topic and the report that the Attorney General's office did with us. Uh, for us. Yeah. And so we have with us uh, Charity Clark um, and Ryan Krieger um, to go over this. And, and actually, um, the thought here is to really not not do too much with any, any of this. It's more for uh, not committee knowledge um, to better understand the um, uh, the pieces concerning data and um, bio data and all of that stuff so that we get ourselves um, acclimated to what we may be looking at next year um, as a consumer protection bill. So, Charity, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, Can I sit in where I usually would sit? Yes, ma'am. First time testifying live in the after times, I guess we would call it. After times. <laughs> <laughs> um, then do you want us to take the flowers somewhere easier? Okay, that's here. Flowers. You can put them, you can pack yeah, them. Maybe I'm trying to put them where they will be safe. You can put them in Kirk's space too. He's, yeah, Kirk will be up for a couple of days. The sun over there. So for the record, I'm Charity Clark. I'm chief of staff at the attorney general's office. I'm also an assistant attorney general, which means I'm a lawyer who's been sworn in. And I came from the consumer division before I was chief of staff. And probably for that reason, I'm here a lot on consumer issues and have worked closely with Ryan and others for the past four years on data privacy issues. So I just want to orient everybody with a little history. But before I do, I want to say that um, I have the bittersweet news of telling you that Ryan is actually leaving our office to go to the Federal Trade Commission, which is incredibly cool for all of us because the FTC is really important for the marketplace and for consumers, but very sad for us. And that is one of the reasons why I wanted to make sure that we could come in and testify before he leaves. Um, Ryan, of course, famously actually teaches the class on privacy at the University of Vermont. So he is a wealth of information um, and has worked closely on this for years. So um, let's let's go back to the last time I testified in this committee. It was March of 2020. And we, the Attorney General's Office, had just sued Clearview AI. That lawsuit is ongoing. Um, Clearview AI is a facial recognition software company. They screen scrape the internet for images um, that are public. So for example, if my, you know, my, my Facebook profile is public, they might take that picture. I don't think they're supposed to by the terms of Facebook, but they might, um, so just to give you an example. One of the challenges, of course, is um, the, the, the bots or whatever they're called that do the screen scraping don't discriminate at all. Um, so they just take whatever they see. So if I'm eating a sandwich on Church Street on a bench and I'm in the background of some tourist photo, there I am getting scraped into Clearview AI's database, not even realizing someone took my picture. Um, so that's only the beginning of it. So I'm not gonna go more deeply, but just to keep in mind where this came from. At that time, um, and having learned a lot about uh, what Clearview AI had done and biometric data, generally um, because of the work that we've done with data privacy, we had proposed that the committee adopt a Biometric Information Privacy Act, a BIPA. BIPA was first um, passed in the state of Illinois and other BIPAs have passed since then. And just keeping a pace here, what we did was we met with a lot of the stakeholders and everyone there basically said, you know, this is going really quickly. Why don't we slow down have some more conversations. And so we committed the AG's office to holding forums to talk about a BIPA and other things that might come up. We, Ryan and I, and with, con with consultation with the chair, decided that 2020 was maybe not the best time for those forums. And so we postponed till 2021. And after those three forums that we had across the state, Ryan and I put together this report and attached all the written feedback that we got. Um, and I, I'm happy we got a lot. A lot of people did participate and it was great to see their feedback that we could kind of consider and um, incorporate into the report that we presented. So what I, you know, having gotten us to the report, what I wanted to do is just walk through, like give you the roadmap of the report. Ryan has spent time 
um, putting together an actual language for a bill. Um, and it's based, the, the language is based on, you know, his own smarts, but also other bills that exist around the country. And keep in mind, you know, other states have layered onto other bills and we would be if we pass a bill um, that, that incorporates some of these data privacy protections, we would be like the next evolution. So Ryan has tried to incorporate, you know, all those different to benefit from all the work that other states have done. And of course, all the input that we received from the stakeholders. So with that, and I think most of the overview, if you have the report, which um, I know we submitted to the committee, so it's towards the, the conclusion I tried to summarize, here's like the main points. So the very last page has them. Um, but the first thing is the, the BIPA, um, which would provide protections related to biometric information. And um, what we would advocate for is that the, the protections come with not just the state being able to bring an action, but the individual, so private right of action. Not every state has that, and uh, the Attorney General and Ryan and I feel that's an important element of um, a BIPA. So we would advocate for that, and I think that, that that can be a controversial topic, so that's one that I'll flag for you as not everyone agrees with us on that one. Um, if there is a BIPA, having clear and specific damages, we've heard from stakeholders, is very important. Um, some of the other BIPAs that exist don't apparently have that quite so clearly, so that's something that we'll want to be mindful of. The second is, this might ring a bell, the, um, the, Ca the California Consumer Privacy Act has uh, data minimization provisions, and we, you know, we get our data uh, breach notification act brings those data breach notifications to our office. Ryan and a paralegal in our office handle those and we publish them on our website. And I think when I first started at the AG's office, you know, eight years ago, there was, you know, every couple of days, maybe there was a breach and now we get many, not many, multiple, I think is fair, maybe not many, multiple a day. And so when we're thinking about how common data breaches are, just not having the data can save you a lot of heartache and being not just best practices for businesses because they don't want to find themselves, you know, letting, you know, accidentally unwittingly, unwittingly um, letting data out, um, but helping them and then creating a, you know, an ethos of we don't keep data we don't need. Um, and so we want to incorporate that here in Vermont as well. Ryan will slow down and, and provide more in depth. I just want you to know where we're going. Um, so the, the third thing is, and we talk a lot about data brokers. And um, the you know you might have a like a first party relationship. So if you're getting into your bank, and you're using you know uh, voice recognition or something like that, that's biometric information, and you have this relationship with your bank. But what if the bank does something with that? You know, I mean, there's like another person, and that data broker um, is the concept where there's other people involved. And so you might have a one-to-one -one relationship with a company and you're comfortable, but with a data broker, they're buying the information from someone else. It gets more complicated. And this would address that dynamic. Cause I think a lot of people don't realize that data brokers even exist. They, they don't know when they get a free app on their phone, that the reason why it's free is because it's not free. They're paying with their data. Um, and this would address that. The fourth thing would, um, and this I, was this Colorado that do not track. So there is a state that has put this out there. They haven't rounded out what it's actually going to look like at this point in time. But it's the concept that you have a right to like say I don't want to be tracked. Like don't follow my info. Don't collect my info. So we have another. We, we tried to model other states if they're doing something. We're not trying to, you know, um, create anything new. If there was another state that had already acted in the space. We have uh, several provisions to expand the data broker law. Um, I think maybe the most significant would be to allow for an opt out. Right now, we have a ability to say whether an opt out is a choice. Um, this would be to require people to opt out um, from having their data collected and sold. Um, so that would be there's other elements as well that are more housekeeping, but that would be a, a good one to include. And then the last one on our list was several components of the California Consumer Privacy Act. They're kind of sort of a grab bag, so I, I struggle to summarize them here, but there's three that I wanted to just flag for you. Parental consent, the do not sell my personal information component, and then the right to be forgotten. 
So when you see that old picture of yourself on the internet and you're thinking, what was I thinking with that haircut? On MySpace. <laughs> yeah, on MySpace or Friendster or whatever. Um, you have a right to be <laughs> forgotten. So th that is my roadmap. Again, if you just look on the back of the report, and this is sort of what, I, what I'm following. Ryan has so much detail that I have to do this for my own self to like create a roadmap, but that those are the items. Each one of these could essentially be its own little bill. I mean, some by BIPA wouldn't be little, but you know, each one of them could be addressed separately. This is a comprehensive package. It was sort of like once we got started, we couldn't ignore these other things that seemed to be worthwhile and we could see were being done in other places uh, for the most part. So I think I won't take questions. I'm gonna allow Ryan to dig in a little bit more deeply now that you have that roadmap. Um, feel free to ask him all the questions that you need because as you know, we only have them for another like three weeks. So <laughs> um, unless you want to take uh, Ryan's privacy class at UVM, which you will be continuing to teach, I think. So with that, I'll pass it over to Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. Well, many know that it's uh, the the report that Charity awesome. cited was on our reports page under the um, member that's on the Attorney General's office dated January 5th. It's on our page or the AG's office? Our page. Because I couldn't find the Office of Attorney General, January 5th, on the report, under the reports tab. Under A's office, rather than A for Attorney General. Yeah. Oh, okay. There it is. Just helping. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we look under AG. <laughs> Help that. Right. Yeah. Office is hard. Yeah. Office of the Attorney General. Thank you. <laughs> there we are. Okay. Under reports and other resources. Yes, under reports. Uh -huh. <clears throat> opening up. Well, maybe reports and resources tab and go down to the Got office it. of the attorney general and there's one report there. They're tracking their faces and I can't find their reports. Report to <laughs> General Assembly on privacy <laughs> January 5th. I do have a copy if someone wants one. Have you got anyone? Did you get it to work? Oh yeah, over. This one? No, over here. So different. Maybe we have a loading program. Please stand by for technical improvements. Are <laughs> <laughs> so you going to live in DC? Or you're gonna be I'm going to be here? telecommuting, actually. Oh, that's not yeah. Yeah. It's amazing what you change in two years. I know, right? Yeah. 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 Good, because we need to. people to stay in Vermont. So <laughs> yes, thank you for staying here. Exactly. Well, that was a requirement. <laughs> yes. I wouldn't have gone otherwise. <laughs> Hi, and welcome to the committee. So why don't we get started as members uh, identify where the report is? Sure. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ryan Krieger. I am with the Public Protection Division of the Vermont Office of the Attorney General. Before I get started, is, um, is it possible to get the language up on the screen that I submitted? That would probably make it easier for me to walk through what we've done. Uh, if not, I could just describe it. Um, um, I can. I'm not sure if I have the document. Though. You'd be able to find the email? Yes. Let me see okay. what I can do. So okay. It would have gone to Marco and you. And, uh, oh, great. <laughs> okay. Uh, while, while she quickly does that, um, I want to say, you know, it makes me very gladdened to be able to be here and uh, describe this comprehensive privacy bill. Uh, this is something that Vermont has needed for a long time, that everyone's needed for a long time that the states have been stepping in and creating laws like this while everyone kind of looks up at Congress and says, is something going to happen at the federal level? Every session they say this may be the session it happens and then it hasn't happened yet. So, you know, it's great that the states, the laboratories of democracy have been trying <clears throat> things to try to uh, provide this critical protection uh, for Vermonters. It's also, of course, bittersweet because this is probably going to be the last time that I'm testifying here. Um, as I was uh, walking in here, just if you could humor me for a second, I was thinking back 10 years ago, the first time I testified, came in here with Wendy Morgan, uh, I think it was this room, and uh, I had recently come from a firm in New York City. I was wearing, I think, $350 leather shoes, which were very un uh, uncomfortable, um, and a big black wool overcoat that cut down the hair and didn't provide any protection whatsoever, and I had my briefcase. And I was very excited to be, you know, working for the state of Vermont and, you know, working in the legislature. And I recall someone sitting on Wendy's other side leaned into her and said, 
who's the New Yorker? Nailed. <laughs> <laughs> so, exactly. So, you know, I've, 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 you know, I've learned my <laughs> lesson since then, and I think about uh, everything that's changed since in the last 10 years. Um, so yeah, I'm sure that you know I'm going to walk into my first you know meeting at the FTC at some point wearing my boots and my vest and everything, and they're going to say, "Who's the Vermonter?" Huh? <laughs> yes. Okay, so uh, I'm going to get started on the bill. So I guess it's not up yet, but but that's okay. I'm going to I'm going to talk through the general elements of it. Um, first, I want to note something that Charity talked about with Clearview and uh, public data, how they are collected. Uh, public data that people posted on uh, social media. Now, in most privacy laws you see, including data breach notification acts, you'll often see some exemption for public data. And it has become pretty much a, a standard thing in privacy laws. It was not always that way. And it is not necessarily the best policy to include that exemption because public data has been interpreted very, very broadly. Anything anyone puts on the internet is public data. Anything that comes from government records is public data. Even if that government record before the internet probably would have been sitting in a filing cabinet somewhere and no one would have ever seen it, now it can be collected, and it is collected, you know, merged with a lot of extra data, and we're talking about property records, voting records, um, uh, court documents, right? So uh, th this public data exemption has in some ways kind of come out to swallow the whole. And the last section uh, includes a recommendation that perhaps we study this public data issue more closely because I'm not suggesting we do away with it entirely. Um, I'm suggesting that it really does require a deeper look. I think you would hear from some folks who support the public uh, exemption that there is a First Amendment right and that you can't do anything about that. I think that the law is not nearly as settled as some would have you believe on that issue, but it requires further study. And I didn't want to take on that fight in this bill, but I think it's, it's worth looking at in the future. Um, the order of the bill starts with some new definitions. Then it goes to general requirements and collection and then biometrics, even though biometrics is kind of our main priority, it didn't seem to make sense to start with biometrics before the general provisions. A few definitions that are included here, biometric identifier is a key definition in any biometric law. We took the biometric identifier definition that we had negotiated in the data broker bill. So it tracks that language ident uh, identically. We discussed it in the hearings, and I, I don't think it makes sense to really you know, reopen that can of worms because there was a lot of effort that went into getting that definition down, and we still think it's a strong definition and appropriate for this law. Um, the next definition that's introduced is called personal information. Now, um, there is a, 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 a gentleman who has appeared at many of these uh, uh, testimony. He, he may be viewing in right now. He's shown up at almost all of the hearings uh, named Thomas Weiss, who has uh, written extensive reports on this bill. He's probably analyzed this bill, uh, uh, the Privacy Law in Vermont, more extensively than I have. And his, his insight has been very, very valuable. One of the points that he makes is that we have a lot of definitions of personal information in chapter 62. We have personally identifiable information, PII, brokered personal information, covered information, uh, login credentials. And it seems like every time we create a new bill, we create a new definition of personal information to go with it. I don't think that really helps anyone, especially the business community, because the definition tells businesses how they're supposed to treat certain data. And there's, you know, it's like a Venn diagram, you know, social security number is in all of them, but, you know, address might be in one of them. So I think it makes sense to try to coordinate these definitions. It might make sense that certain laws require very specific definitions, but I was hesitant to introduce a new one. So for the purposes of this kind of general requirements, I'm, we're suggesting a definition of personal information that is very broad and expressly includes, but is not limited to, personally identifiable, brokered, login credentials, and covered information just to say, okay, if you're covering the other ones, it's within this one as well. Okay, so 
Uh, of all the definitions, broker personal information currently is the broadest one. That might be you know, the one to go with, but uh, this, is, this is an attempt to kind of uh, coordinate all those. And uh, Ledge Council probably has some, some thoughts on how to coordinate them as well. Since our law is going to deal with selling information, I think that is going to be uh, a definition that you're going to want to think about. The proposed language brings in uh, the definition of sell from California, where they did do a lot of debate over that. Uh, personally, I, I think that selling information is selling information, and it, it's you know we, we've ha you know there, there is something to be said for broad language. Um, you know, the, the the main privacy law that we enforce right now is the Consumer Protection Act. And it was modeled after a law that was passed in 1910, and it says unfair and deceptive acts and practices are illegal. That's basically the law. And that has worked for over a century. And it has applied to a lot of different things, and it bans unfairness. You know, and the courts have figured out what that means, and you know, the agencies have figured out what that means. The current trend is to negotiate language down to the the, the comma which seems like it would give specificity, but then when you actually try to apply it in, in the real world, someone's ready to jump out and go, aha, no, you put that clause there instead of there, and therefore this doesn't apply at all. Um, one area that I found that it, it um, shows up in a lot is uh, the definition of robocalls at the federal level. Um, it, it was defined so specifically that a lot of what is currently going on does not fall under the definition of robocall, which is one of the reasons why it's become so difficult to stop these things. So I think, you know, uh, that's a, that's a, a constant. So I, we do have it up behind you now. Great. Uh, okay. And so I'm on the first page. That was the definition of cell, um, right there. Yep. Okay. So let's move on to the first section: uh, general requirements. Um, we repeat these terms a lot in Section A, owns, licenses, maintains, or possesses. Th those are terms that show up in the Data Breach Notification Act. Those are kind of the four different ways that you can you know, interact with a, you, it's either your data, you've licensed it from someone else, uh, you maintain it on behalf of someone else, or you just possess it in, in some way. That's probably the broadest definition. The first big requirement is B, data minimization. And this language came out of the CCPA. Uh, Consumer Reports also has a model bill which has data minimization language. Um, and I, I think uh, Charity pretty much summed up the reasons why data minimization is so important. Uh, we should think about data minimization in two directions. One is it, it means don't collect data that you don't need in the first place. And the second is don't keep data longer than you need it for. And it really addresses two separate practices. We know that there are you know, apps on the App Store uh, or on Android phones that you know, it, it might be a calculator app that's collecting your geolocation information. Why is it collecting your geolocation information? Because it wants to sell your geolocation information to someone else. It doesn't care about really calculating numbers. It cares about harvesting your data. A data minimization requirement would pretty much you know, wipe out that entire practice of, of surreptitiously collecting your data um, unless, of course, you know, someone consented to it or you were very, very clear. Um, the other practice is one that we see in data breach a lot, which is, you know, it is a company that has, you know, they, they do have data retention policies. They do try to collect only the data they need. But then you see a data breach and you see 15 year old data has been lost. Data of, com of customers who haven't been a customer for a decade was lost. And you're asking, well, why did, why did you still have this data? And I think that's also critically important because we've been trying to fight data breaches for a decade now, and we still have lots and lots of data breaches. And you will hear companies say, and it is true, that you can have reasonable data security and still have a data breach. If, if China or Russia or North Korea wants to get into your systems, there's not much even a very sophisticated company would be able to do about it. But the one thing they do have control over is what data they collect. That, that, is, that is something that, that you know, we can we can um, encourage businesses, and I'm informed that within the business community there is a trend towards data minimization already. That is a best practice, which is being pushed out. But I think that uh, a stronger push would probably be necessary. So the next part goes to secondary uses of data. So secondary uses would be when you have sold or shared or that data onto the next uh, the next party, and. Basically, it says, that the key thing, it says, 
that if you have this data that you've gotten from someone else, you can't use it for a purpose inconsistent with the purpose for which it was collected um, or for the consent with which it was originally collected. Now, every- hey, Ryan, are you expecting someone to also come in, uh, Jenny Blair? Uh, uh, that, that's someone I know who is, uh, yeah, wanted to just- uh, But we're not expecting her to testify. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, thank you. So, you can also, Ryan, are we, should we scroll? Where, what number are you? Oh, we're, we're on uh, C1. Yeah, if you yeah, can so scroll up, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I may have forwarded on the testifying uh, link instead of the general link. Um, okay. So, uh, it basically says that if data was collected for a certain purpose and it's shared on to someone else, they have to use it for that purpose. We are told that this is a requirement which is violated frequently. Uh, information is sold for geolocation purposes, you know, in order to do mapping or some third party, and then it is sold on and on and on and on until eventually it's in some sort of spyware app or maybe sold to uh, um, uh, law enforcement, uh, federal or state, you know, to track people. Um, and you will likely hear from both data collectors and third parties that they always respect the consent with which it was collected and you know they would never think of sharing it on for some other purpose. Uh, I think that there's a lot of reason to believe that that is not the case. Most importantly, right now, if a company shares data with another company, there's a contractual obligation between them to maybe to, to share it. But if that contract is breached, the only remedy is for the company that shared it to sue them for breach of contract for using it for a different purpose, which the original company probably doesn't have a huge economic incentive to do. And the company that then breached the contract hasn't broken any laws. They can actually use it for whatever they want. So basically there aren't really consequences if a company goes on and does that. So I think the secondary use is, is uh, an important thing to uh, enshrine the law there. Um, and then the second part says that if the uh, subparagraph two at the very bottom of page one says that if a company, a consumer's personal information uh, is, sorry, if a data collector is unable to determine the original uh, reason, then they can't use the data. They can't retain it. So there's your incentive. They, you, 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 you use it for the reason that it was originally collected. You have an incentive to document the reason it was originally collected and make sure that is included with the data. Because if you can't do that, then you should not be able to use the data. You shouldn't be able to say, oh, we don't know where we got this data from, this non-public data, so we're just gonna use it for whatever purpose we want. Um, and and it, I think in terms of data brokers, as well as a lot of companies, you will see that um, the justification for holding these huge tranches of data is either it was public, or there was consent originally to get it. So the question is, if you go to them and say, okay, what was the consent and where was the consent and do you have that documented? That's the part where this will be able to enforce. And I think it will cause businesses to maybe take their, uh, step up their bookkeeping records to make sure that that consent is well tracked. Um, part D is, is a bit of a placeholder. Uh, I wasn't sure whether or not the committee would have time to look at this um, bill, this, Session. I knew that if they did, they'd have to move quickly on it. CCPA and CPRA, the, the follow-up law in California, are very long laws with very long regulation attached to them. If we had included all of that language, it would have swamped everything else. So I think that's a further conversation. I included some of the language, but there are lots of other things in those laws that the committee might think are useful to put in. Uh, so that might be something else to, uh, to consider. Lastly, uh, in this section is do not track. Uh, over a decade ago, there was a movement to create this notion of do not track. If you go into your web browser in, this, in the uh, option somewhere, there is a do not track option. You can check a box. Originally, there was a, a notion that anyone receiving that, um, that and I think it would be like a self-regulatory idea, that anyone receiving that message would not track you but it didn't go anywhere, it got bogged down, and it kind of ended up just being a recommended, you know, uh, a suggestion not to track. So the idea is the technology is already there in terms of on the consumer side to say do not track, but it's not enforced. And so this would uh, require 
some sort of uh, enforcement of that do not track signal. Um, the next part, and I'm on page two, 2445, um, I suggest taking that safe destruction of documents. It has a definition of personal information, and I suggest replacing that with PII just to normalize everything. And that way, we don't have two different definitions of personal information in the same chapter, which, of course, would be confusing. Next, we get on to biometric information. Now, for this law, I looked closely at the Illinois BIPA law, which is a fairly short law, and then the uh, Washington State BIPA law, which a lot of folks uh, suggested was the template to go off of. I spoke to some folks in Washington, looked closely at the law, and realized that uh, there, are, uh, there are a lot of weaknesses in that law. And so if we're going to do a BIPA law, I think that we should try to do it right uh, and close some of those gaps in the law. Um, so the first section is collection, use, and retention of biometric information. And it says that if you want to collect and use biometric information, you should provide clear and conspicuous notice, obtain consent to use it, and provide a mechanism to prevent the subsequent use of a biometric uh, identifier. The next part is you should have a retention schedule. This is, comes from the Illinois BIPA for how long you're going to keep it. Now, before we go further in this bill, I want to jump down to the bottom of page three. Number eight. This is not something in any of uh, the Washington or Illinois bills. This is a carve out. One of the things that we learned when we were looking at biometrics is that there are two broad reasons why biometrics are collected. One is for identification, and the other is for authentication. Okay? Identification is who is this random person? We want to know who they are. Authentication is we know, who you, we know who you claim to be. We want to make sure you are who you say you are. The technology of matching is different. Authentication is a one-to-one -one match. We already have your photo. We already have your voice print. We want to make sure you are who you say you are. And we're just comparing these two things. Identification is a one-to-many. It's we have this massive database of photos or whatever. We've collected this, and we want to identify you. The, the general sense seems to be that authentication is not that controversial. People like using biometrics for, uh, uh, I don't want to say all people, I'm sure there are a lot of people who object, but I think as a general matter, you know, you pick up your, your iPhone and it recognizes your face or your thumbprint, that's a, that can be a very useful thing as long as they're protecting it properly. You know, that, that can be a very, and not selling it on for other uses, uh, that can be a very valuable thing. It's the Identification, which is where surveillance comes in, which is where you don't know what it's being used for, you know, comes in, that people really have issues. So in this bill, I'm recommending that we basically carve out the authentication part of it. One of the objections that we hear from a lot of folks to BIPA is that it is going to harm people's ability to prevent fraud and to stop crime and, you know, all these other uh, parade of horribles. And I noticed that the other laws don't really distinguish between these two functionalities. So what this says is, and, and I'm mentioning this because everything else you reach has to be against the background of the fact that there's this big carve out. Nothing in this section requires an entity to provide notice and obtain consent, collect, use, or retain. So no notice or consent. There still has to be a, manner, a method to opt out, perhaps. But uh, A, uh, the bi uh, I'm on page four. The biometric, if the biometric identifier will be used solely to authenticate the consumer for the purpose of securing the goods and services provided by the business, so that's probably the biggest use, uh, or um, and uh, the biometric identifier will not be leased or sold to a third party, and the biometric identifier will only be disclosed to a third party for the purpose of effectuating 8A and the third party is contractually obligated to maintain the confidentiality of the biometric and not further disclose it. And of course, that general usage would create a separate backstop of 
uh, stopping them from doing that. So this is the idea of um, trying to like make a biometric law that, that works for businesses that allows them to keep doing that. Now, what this law does not have is a general prevention of uh, fraud prevention or a general law enforcement exception. And part of the issue there is, as Charity pointed out, the way we came here in the first place was because of the action, you know, the, the initial impetus to start looking at this was people being very upset about Clearview AI. Now, Clearview AI now has a 10 billion photograph database that continued to uh, collect all of this information. And if, and if you, you know, go on their website and if you, you know, ask them what they're using it for, they will say, well, it's for law enforcement and fraud prevention. So if you put a broad law enforcement and fraud prevention exemption in a law, then you know, everything Clearview AI is doing may end up being legal, which kind of seems to uh, uh, you know, defeat the, the notion of what we're trying to get at. Obviously, this is not a law which we're specifically targeting Clearview AI, not at all. But it was that sort of behavior that caused us to start thinking along those lines. So going back to page uh, two, one of the uh, concerns we heard was that uh, notice was unclear. And just saying you need to provide notice uh, didn't give the level of specificity necessary. So we tried to describe what should go into the notice. Then we heard uh, consent was unclear. How, how, how is consent supposed to be collected? And uh, that's under 5A on page three. It says it must be opt in and it may be accomplished in writing by indicating assent through an electronic form, through a recording of verbal assent or in any other way that is reasonably calculated to collect informed confirmable consent. Now, if, if, if the business community comes in and says, okay, there's another way that we collect consent that we need to make sure is in there, that's great. The goal here was to create a broad description of these are the things that constitute consent. Now, consent is not, we put it in our privacy uh, uh, um, disclosure on page 15 and you didn't uncheck a box and therefore you've consented. Uh, but we, the, the goal here was to create a law that provided the clarity which we have heard some of the other laws do not have. Um, Brian, when, yes. so when we talk about recording of a verbal assent, I know there's been issues with some fraud happening um, with, you know, telemarketers calling and, and you answer the phone and, uh, you know, and they ask, is this so-and-so? And you say yes. And then they, they dub that into an assent. Um, so I'm not. I, I, I agree. I had that same thought that, that that is something that we would need to think about. Um, and I'm not, I mean, if, if the committee thinks that that is creating too much of a risk, then they may choose to strike that language, or maybe there's a way to address that concern. But I mean, any, you're right, any consent can be, you know, uh, fraudulently created, exactly. Uh, and that is something that we should be uh, wary of. Um, so <clears throat> section four basically says that, um, uh, biometric identifier may not use, sell, lease, or otherwise disclose unless uh, there are, these are ORs underneath this. And by the way, one of the distinctions between this law and the Washington BIPA law is Washington BIPA law prohibits uh, selling and leasing in all of its section, but not using. So if a company collects data, biometric information, without anyone's consent, they can use it, they just can't sell it, which seemed like a big uh, exemption that you know we wanted to uh, make sure was was uh, addressed, um, and basically it says that um, if you want to use it, sell it, lease it, you have to either have obtained consent, or if it's necessary to provide the product or service subscribed to, requested, or expressly authorized, and the business has notified the consumer of the purpose and what third party. The identifier it doesn't say clearly and conspicuously. It just has to have been notified. So, so this is an attempt to say, look, you can use this data if it is directly tied to, you know, providing the product. Okay. We're, this is this is uh, 
This is a law that is trying to restrict the worst acts, but not get in the way of businesses doing business and consumers being able to benefit from the many conveniences uh, that are provided by biometrics. The third uh, is it is necessary to affect, administer, enforce, or complete a financial transaction that the consumer uh, requested, initiated, or authorized. And you know, there are disclosures and things like that. And the idea behind that is we know that biometrics are used uh, in the banking industry, in the financial industry. Um, you know, I, I uh, was talking to someone at my uh, retirement uh, company that has my financials, and they told me that uh, one of their backups is they actually use voice pattern recognition. If I call in and say, I am who I say I am, but my voice doesn't match, uh, then they'll know that. And I thought, well, that's neat. I had no idea you were doing that. You didn't disclose it to me, but I, I, I appreciate that you don't want to let a fraudster come in and empty my, you know, my retirement account. You know, so we don't want to stop, you know, banks and financial institutions from protecting people. Um, but you know, we want to make so so that that is that exemption is, is to try to address that, and that that also gets to that fraud prevention notion. Um, but we do want to you know have the protections in place, John. Ask a, a little follow-up question. Sure, sure. For example, Absolutely. you know, calling the bank here, you know, so you you call uh, like your insurance company, and they say, you know, you know, here's all your choices because you get a recording. And it says, you know, please tell us what you want. You know, is that more voice recognition data too, or is that just part of the recording system? I mean, I, I can't speak. I can't speak to how anyone right, operates, exactly. but I would imagine anytime they're collecting your voice, there is that potential to be able to yeah. apply voice recognition to it. Yeah, it's just, it's just so, those simple things we're all kind of like engaged in these days. Yeah, you know? so that you know, I can't say that anyone's specifically doing that, yeah. but it, it tell you us know, your issue. Tell, tell us which part of the company you want to, you know, contact. Uh, potentially. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and then finally, required by a federal statute, court order, uh, which is pretty standard. Um, okay. Five is describing what the consent means. Uh, six is. Uh, basically data security and retention of biometric identifiers. And seven uh, is uh, basically says you can't share it in ways, you know, if you, if you do have consent to share it, you're allowed to share it, but it has to be for reasoning that it was originally collected for. You can't get a general consent and say, okay, now we're gonna sell or facial recognition information to law enforcement agencies if that is not something that you specifically consented to in the first place. Okay, eight is that uh, authentication carve out. Uh, then under enforcement, uh, a few things to point out. So the first section under enforcement, I'm on page four, is standard attorney general enforcement. B is, uh, this, this, is, this is something which, which I kind of wish we had in a lot of other sections of 63, honestly. But the, the, when you say the attorney general may enforce, what it means is uh, you can, the attorney general can uh, issue penalties of up to $10,000 per violation. Now, from an enforcement perspective, that is both a blessing and a curse. Because one, it is a very strong penalty. And it allows us to investigate cases, including against very well-resourced large businesses and try to get uh, protections for consumers because they know that the penalty could be very, very, very large. The curse is that when it comes to actually calculating the penalty, it can be very difficult when you say, okay, well, you hurt 200 Vermonters, so that is somewhere between you know, one and $20 million, or you heard 2,000 or 20,000, so now we're up to 2 billion trillions. Like, how do you find a number between those two, especially if it's, we've never enforced on this particular action before? So the idea here is to try to give some sort of guidance to the enforcers of the law as to what they should be thinking about when calculating a penalty under this law. And there are other, I think statutes that I think even the CCPA has some similar language. Um, and the, the, the suggestions in here, and again, these are ones that could be open to discussion. Um, the seriousness of the violation, the size and sophistication of the business violating the subchapter. So if a, a local business violates you know, one of these privacy laws and a few hundred dollar penalty is assessed, that doesn't mean that a 
giant tech company can say, well, your precedent is a few hundred dollars. You know, we say, no, no, the size and sophistication, because <clears throat> the point of the penalty is to prevent businesses from violating the law. If they think that um, violating the law is just a cost of doing business, and it's more profitable to violate than to not to, then you know, we're, we're kind of wasting our time here. So did you, do you have like the $10,000 per day? If they were getting $100,000 per day, then man, you just continue doing business. Well, exactly. I mean, that, that, that would be the analysis, yeah. So would there be some, any assessment of what they're actually able to, to make off of that? I mean, the guy with 10 billion photographs could be making a substantial daily income. Certainly, I mean the 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 profitability could certainly be something that could be considered in there. Um, I would also note that there is uh, there is the opportunity for disgorgement. Basically, you have to give up all your profits. That can be very difficult to calculate. Uh, so you know, and, and and to get agreement to. So it's it's not often uh, implemented, uh, at least in Vermont. Um, um, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I remember our conversation from uh, like a year ago, actually, where we started dancing onto this topic. So I have other larger questions, but specifically on enforcement, I, I'm wondering if, if there's other examples in law, or this could be an example of it, but you know, we're talking about so many companies that often also do uh, business with the actual state of Vermont or other public entities within Vermont. And I'm just wondering, as part of this enforcement, if there could also be something that would preclude a business from being able to do business with the state of Vermont, like a bank, for example, if they really violate this, they don't get to get a, a large state contract or continue with us, you know, either forever or for some period of time of, I don't know if debarment's the right word for contracting or not, but it just seems like so many companies collect data that there's extra pieces beyond a, um, you know, whatever the AG's office might be able to assess as a penalty that would also be an added carrot not to do this and to comply. I, I think that could be something for the committee certainly to discuss. I will I'll suggest that a, a couple you know, unexpected consequences of something like that could be, uh, one, if the company's, say, you know, major contract is with the state of Vermont, mm -hmm and it's a must, you must stop doing business, then violating this law could end up being a death penalty for a business, mm -hmm. which means that we might be hesitant to you know, enforce the law. And one of the examples that I always go back to is FERPA, the, the law that protects education privacy. Mm -hmm. There's only one penalty for violating FERPA, which is complete removal of federal funding from the school that violated FERPA. Mm -hmm. It's never been enforced. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, we, we wanna be careful about that. Uh, the other concern might be that if, you know, if there is an entity in Vermont state government that is reliant on a specific technology, then that's going to bring a political element into whether or not to enforce it, right? If you enforce this thing, then we're not going to be able to use this tool anymore. And so that could complicate factors further. So that's just, I'm not suggesting yes or no, but that's two things that occur to me to think about. Mr. Chairman, what happens if the, um, breach or the violation of this is a state agency? Well, the Security Breach Notice Act applies to state agencies. Yeah. So a decision should be made as to whether or not this should apply to state agencies. I would suggest that, you know, at the federal level, there is the, uh, the Privacy Act from the 1970s. They have their own separate regulatory structure around how the state should treat people's data. Vermont actually doesn't have a state version of that. And that may make sense to have something like that. Maybe it could be done just by incorporating states into this. Maybe there are reasons why that would require something different, and that would require probably bringing in folks from law enforcement and the Secretary of State's office and all the other stakeholders who you know, are collecting data uh, about uh, Vermonters just to make sure. So uh, it's, it's certainly something that I think you know, should be considered. I don't think the current language as it applies would bring in the state. But you know that's a policy decision for the committee uh, to decide. Um, okay. Um, so size and sophisticated, and then you know another one I put in was uh, the business's history of respecting or failing to respect the privacy of consumers. There are certain businesses out there that are just known bad actors, and if they're known bad actors, it's usually because they feel like it's more profitable than not to do it, and they're going to keep getting away with it. <clears throat> And so in those circumstances, I think it makes sense for the penalty to say, look, you know, even though it wasn't we who enforced against you, it's seven other states, it's the FTC, it's Europe and Australia, 
we can look at those and say, you need a bigger penalty. And then it expressly says, with maximum penalties imposed where appropriate. We very rarely do maximum penalties in these cases, and there's almost no precedent for doing that. But I think that if, if we can point to a legislative edict and say, look, you know, we can tick all the boxes. This is what's at stake here. I think that would you know, be, be uh, fairly effective. And at the same time, I think it would stop you know, some you know, fictional overzealous AG 10 years from now from trying to bring maximum penalties down on you know, a small business you know, that's struggling to survive. We, we don't want that happening either. Um, so, uh, so C, um, so this is, is one to say, well, you know, as soon as this thing is enforced, there's gonna be a lot of companies that are not in compliance with this law. So it suggests that uh, you have 180 days to come into compliance with the law. So instead of saying, let's push out uh, it going into effect for a year, uh, let's say, you know, put it in effect whenever you want, and then you have 180 days. And then after that 180 days, $10,000 per day if you haven't come into compliance. So there is a generous amount of time to get into effect, but a strong penalty if you don't. And, and I think that's important because I think there may be some companies who come back and say, um, due to the nature of the way that we collect our data, there's no way to come into compliance. We can't get this consent. It's not going to happen. And that creates this strange uh, problem for enforcers. Well, you know, we don't want to necessarily shut this company down, but they are in violation. What do we do? And this gives them the, the answer, $10,000 per day. You don't want to comply with the law, you know, $10,000 per day. Um, if you think that there are some giant companies for which even $10,000 a day wouldn't be uh, a sufficient uh, incentive, then you might want to change that, but that, that's what is uh, suggested to start. Yeah, um, that's interesting. I think for a lot of companies, 180 days might be enough, but there may be stuff that's been 30 years old that a company or a business has had. They just can't get the consent. They don't even know where these people are. Right. Um, you know, or how do you deal with that? You know, I mean, I mean, hopefully we have businesses that have been around 30, 40 sure. years sure. or longer. So what do you do if they have lack of consent? Well, I maybe not just biometric, but sure. all of the data. Sure. I think that this is a fundamental question that we're going to have to ask ourselves. There might be some basic business models that this law says you can't do if anymore. You're anymore. Yeah. And I guess if you wanted to, you could grandfather in certain businesses and say, you know, you can continue these practices because it wasn't illegal when you started. You could grandfather them for five years or something, or you could say, this wasn't okay when you did it. We just didn't know you were doing it. And mm -hmm. congratulations, you were able to be profitable doing it for 30 years, but you've been violating the privacy of Vermonters for 30 years, and now you have to stop. I'm not suggesting that's, you know, that's kind of a draconian way to go about it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's, that's the, the, the decision. Because you're right, there are certain businesses that make, in, including, frankly, I think, probably Clearview AI. Uh, they've said in court that they have no way of knowing uh, where people are from, therefore, because they collected this information with no regard for anyone's privacy, they can't remove it. So, you know, I, and, the, you know, this might, might address that sort of thing as well. Emma? Oh, okay. um, so, uh, are there any examples of, of um, more progressive violations, progressive in the amounts of the violation? Because in today's world, we have mega corporations, and then we have minor cor corporations. And I'm thinking of um, Facebook, aka Meta, or whatever it's called sure. now, and Amazon. Sure. I mean, ten thousand dollars is a sneeze for them, or whatever the comparable is. And ten thousand dollars for like a Vermont based business is massive, most likely, right? So I'm just wondering if there's ever, if, again, if there are examples of a more progressive penalty structure if that's even legal, because we really want, if we really want to go here, it's make, getting people's attention, especially those who like Amazon and. Um, meta or whatever it's called, um, they make so much profit off of this stuff and, this, and for this particular um, bill. So, so the one that I uh, that occurred to me. So, so the first thing I would suggest is that if there is a like some of these companies, these big companies, you know, uh, might have two hundred thousand uh, Vermonters. You know, they violated. In fact, I think that's how much the Equifax breach affected. Mm -hmm. Two hundred thousand times ten thousand. I'm one of them. Is it that? That's a pretty big number, even for yeah. you know a massive corporation. So we do have a pretty high upper limit. Mm -hmm. But in terms of you know really trying to get at that sort of issue that 
you specifically said, I think that GDPR, the European privacy law, tried to get at that. Um, and, and I hope I don't misstate this. I believe the maximum penalty under GDPR for a willful or reckless violation is 40 million euros or up to 4% of the company's previous year's global revenues. Whoa. And not profits, wow. revenues wow. globally, even if it was in one company. <clears throat> That's a lot. <laughs> and, and, and I'm, you know, I, I would assume that they were thinking of exactly those companies when they created that. So, uh, I mean, that that's a model. I don't know if any law in Vermont has tried, or in the United States has tried doing something like that, but uh, that that could be, you know, how that sort of thing does. I do think, though, that our 10,000 times a large number probably gets to that, mm -hmm. or, or could get to that in, a, in an extreme case. Mm -hmm. um, John? So, um, <clears throat> there may be a business, there probably are businesses out there don't realize or they're violating mm -hmm. this kind of thread here that you're sharing with us here today. So um, uh, unless unless there's a complaint mm -hmm. with your office, right, right. And so then they're notified by your office. Right. So there's that, you know, track of things here, so to speak. So um, you may be getting to this a little bit later on in your proposal here, but how does a business find out how they ought to be operating in terms of staying in compliance with this law here? Sure. Um, this proposal here. I'm just thinking down the road at some point in time, all businesses not, um, or whatever state need to know about this versus just assuming they know about it. Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. There, there's a couple ways to address that. Um, when I first started uh, working with the Security Breach Notice Act, it was probably about four years old, five years old, and we were seeing companies having breaches and not complying with the law. And we were, you know, much more gentle with businesses, you know, at the time, right? We said, we, we understand you probably haven't ever heard of this. Um, I went out and spoke to anybody, any organization that would listen, you know, giving presentations. I gave presentations to the Fuel Dealers Association and to the bar and the real estate bar about how to comply with the law. So that would be one solution, at least in Vermont, is let's really, you know, do uh, some, some public knowledge, you know, get the awareness out there. Um, in terms of on the national level, there are law firms and, and, and business associations who monitor these things and they, they push out that knowledge to their membership uh, to try to you know, get them to know about these things. And you know, often they do it as, they may do it as you know, like a sales pitch, like, like here's a cute new law you need to comply with. So you know, let's tell you all about that law. Um, there are even, um, and we've seen this, um, you, know, you may have noticed that about Two years ago, these little banners started showing up at the bottom of websites asking you which cookies you wanted to opt in and opt out of. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, I believe, a response to GDPR. So GDPR passed laws that basically made this kind of like vast cookie collection suddenly problematic without consent. So tech addressed the tech issue. Businesses showed up and said, we're going to you know, do our plug-in on your website, and it will manage your cookie consents for you. So that's another solution. Sometimes the, the market will provide a market solution to, to these sorts of things. And can I ask us one quick follow-up yeah. question? Yeah. Where might a chamber of commerce fall into? Well, certainly, I think that that could also be. Yeah, you know, I'm just thinking thing. about the conduit here for, yeah. for can that. I, can, can they hear me if I sit here? Sure. I just wanted to your question. Yesterday, I did speak with someone um, from the Vermont Chamber specifically about this. I don't know if she's watching on YouTube, but we've been in conversation with them already. Okay. Yeah. And, and Thank you. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that another policy way to address that is a right to cure. And I, I believe that the California CCPA has a right to cure. Now, uh, the, uh, cons the, the consumer protection side of things generally don't like a right to cure because it basically means you can violate the law until someone notes that you're violating the law and then you have to stop doing it. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, it addresses that issue that if someone inadvertently you know, violated the law, you have to tell them and then they have X amount of time to come back into compliance. Um, I think that I was speaking to someone actually in California about how that was working out. And I think you know, there can be a benefit to the right to cure. And, and I, I doubt a lot of my colleagues in the consumer community would agree with me on this. but. Um, one of the benefits is if you pass a law like this and, and the AG's office is enforcing it, there's going to be a lot of people violating the laws. There's you know, limited resources uh, applied to a broad area. If there's a right to cure uh, that they have to comply with and you know, 
we get a complaint that someone's violating, it would mean we'd say, hey, stop violating it. And then if they stop violating it, we move on. There's plenty of others to move on to. Otherwise, we have to launch an investigation and collect information and negotiate a settlement and do the whole thing. And that's a very long, resource intensive process. Whereas if they were willing to just stop, you know, right. meanwhile, there will be some companies that don't stop once you give them the right to cure. And that signals to us, oh, this is a company that really doesn't want to comply with the law. And it makes it easier to make the decision, OK, this is someone we should bring an enforcement action against. I'm, I, I, it sounds like I'm advocating for a, a, a right to cure. I'm just kind of putting out uh, the issues back and forth. I, I think that there's a lot of things to consider there. But that would be another uh, way of addressing that. Great, thank you. I have sort of like the flip side. You know, how, how do you feel your overarching understanding of the, the magnitude and diversity of folks that are doing things like this is such that we can have some assurance that there's just something flying under the radar that's that even people don't recognize as, as uh, negatively impacting them so they don't have the opportunity to, to complain. And uh, there's probably no cure for that other than if there was a cure after the fact, if it were going on for a certain amount of time, finally you found out. Sure. I, I mean, I think that uh, a lot of the practices that are going on are fairly opaque and people aren't going to know that they're happening. A lot of the ways that we find out about this is through journalists. Um, you know, a, a lot of the worst privacy practices that even the AG's offices have discovered is because, you know, journalists you know, uncovered them. They've been doing a really good job of, of doing that. Um, also, academics, you know, um, and, and some, you know, some other agencies, there, there are ways, or even whistleblowers. I mean, sometimes you see people come forward and say, my company's doing something wrong and I, have, I can't stay quiet on it. So, so that would be another way that we would you know, discover these sorts of things. Um, and and, and pro possibly more likely we get them from those sources necessarily than individual consumers. Um, lastly, we have the uh, private right of action in B2. Um, this private right of action it's kind of, uh, this was taken from the Illinois BIPA law. It was modeled after it. Uh, no, I'm sorry. This was taken from, uh, was based on a Vermont law. So our, fair, our local Fair Credit Reporting Act in Chapter 63 provides a $100 per violation. And so this language is modeled on what we already have for our local Fair Credit Reporting Act, but it imposes the penalties from the Illinois BIPA Act, which is $1,000 for negligent, $5,000 for willful or reckless violation. Where are you, Ryan? Oh, I'm sorry. This should be for uh, page four. Move up a little bit. Uh, yeah, two. Uh, two. Uh, B2. Yeah, do you see it now? Right above exclusions. <laughs> Um, so you're, you're going to hear a lot of uh, concerns about a private right of action. Um, you're going to hear a lot of uh, criticism of plaintiff lawyers and uh, full disclosure. I worked on the plaintiff side a little bit before I came here. I don't think that they are the, you know, uh, um, I, I'll just observe this that, that, you know, you'll hear that they're only doing it for the money and all these other things. When I worked on the plaintiff side, I will say that there were usually a lot of defense lawyers on the other side who I don't think were doing it out of the goodness of their hearts either. Uh, and they were usually actually paid a lot more than the plaintiff's lawyers, uh, to be honest. Uh, so, you know, what it really comes down to is what a private right of action means is if a business hurts you as an individual, you can do something about it. Without a private right of action, your only option is to complain to the consumer assistance program and hope that others have, and hope that because of those complaints, the Attorney General's office is gonna look into it. And if they look into it, you won't know they're looking into it because we don't make our investigations public. And you will hope that you know after the investigation finishes in a year or two years or three years, that there may be some restitution that comes to you. That's, you know, that's what it looks like if you don't have a private right of action. And the fact of the matter is, um, you know, unless you know the legislature is, is willing to uh, budget a, a, a you know, much higher budget to the enforcement of this bill, I think that uh, a private right of action is an important supplement to the ability to make sure that people comply with the law. 
Um, if there are concerns about, you know, rogue class action lawyers or shakedown litigation or, or nuisance litigation or things like that, I think that there are ways that, that those can be addressed and maybe incorporated into the bill. But I do think that if someone is uh, aggrieved by a violation of this law, they should have the ability to do something about it. Um, and, 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 you know, the Attorney General uh, feels uh, strongly on that issue. Um, okay, there is an exclusion which, you know, addresses uh, law enforcement and, and that comes out of uh, one of the other laws. And one thing I didn't put in there, but I flag, if, if it, it may be appropriate in some cases to put a HIPAA exclusion in or a Graham Leach Bliley exclusion in. Um, the thing is, neither of those laws specifically address the collection of biometric information. So to say, if you're complying with HIPAA, you don't have to do X, Y, and Z. A lot of companies comply with HIPAA, but are doing this for totally other reasons. But there may, there may be some things that can be done to, um, to address that. Uh, so that's, uh, before I move on to the data broker section, and I, I don't know if I'm going too long or if you want me to speed up, I can do that. Uh, any qu other questions on or comments on the biometric section? It does actually goes back a little bit, but I mean, you had talked a couple times about consent and, uh, and, and not burying you know, consent in a, in a privacy. But, you know, I mean, I feel like a, for a lot of apps and a lot of websites, you know, it's a, a long term, a legalese term of use, check a box. I tend to feel a lot like very few people read those. Mm -hmm. And um, it, if there was a simple presentation, like your example, uh, you know, a calculator that tracks right. where you're physically located, I think right. very few people would approve of that. Right. Is there any thought around how to make consent a more accessible idea for, for the average citizen? You know, it's a really good question, and it's one where the, the consumer protection ethos is based around the notion of, of consent, uh, disclosure and consent, notice and consent. Basically, you know, if a consumer wants to, you know, climb a rock wall or ski down a mountain and they can, you know, they consent to the risks, then it's great. Um, and, and we respect that. The problem is it really does break down in the privacy sphere because the, it's, it's hard to provide the notice uh, to people. It's hard to provide the notice to people in a way that they really appreciate what you're actually telling them. Um, and you know, even then, it's hard for, for uh, consumers to, to really you know, fully appreciate you know, what's going on. I, I gave an example in class the other day. Uh, FERPA requires a notice to go to all students at the beginning of the year, and it allows you to opt out of uh, directory, sale of directory information, which is information that the school pretty much internally defines as information they can share. And I asked my class of 20 students, I said, you know, you guys are probably more uh, aware of privacy issues than most people. Did any of you sign the FERPA opt out? You know, no hands up. Did any of you know there was a FERPA opt out, right? There's a federal law that requires notice specifically to be sent to people, which was sent to people. UVM complies with the law, but of course, nobody even, you know, still knows that it exists. So there is a huge limitation in this, you know, ability to notify, which is one of the reasons why we do require an opt in consent, right? So, so you have to check this off. Now, in CCPA, um, they have a section that basically says you can't. Uh, you can't refuse to do business with someone if they don't give you consent. So you can't say consent to track your geolocation is a requirement of downloading this uh, calculator app. Um, then it goes on to say that, however, you can give businesses financial or individuals financial incentives to collect their information. Now, I'm not sure what the difference is between saying you can't, you know, not do it if they don't say, but you can. And, and he also says you can't charge more if they don't consent, but you can give them incentive. It's, it's, you know, there are regulations that are trying to deal with that. It's a hard one, especially if everybody, if every uh, app in an industry says, well, we're going to need your biometrics and you have to consent to it and there's no place else you can go. It's a, it's a sticky, it's a sticky problem. Um, I think that the um, data minimization section addresses some of that, right? If there's no reason for you to need this in the first place, you definitely can't collect it. Uh, but yeah, it's at, at the very least, the notice will make it aware that it's happening. Um, 
it will mean that they can't sell it on to other people who are going to use it for other reasons, which I think, you know, even if no one really reads the consent or sees the consent, the consent isn't going to say we're collecting your location so that we can sell it to Homeland Security. It's probably not going to say that. Uh, and if they don't put that in, then that means they can't sell your geolocation to Homeland Security or to someone else who's then going to sell it to Homeland Security or something like that, just to, just to give an example. Um, okay, we have 45 minutes left. Just want to make sure everybody realizes that. Maybe a little less time before we start at 11. It can be concise. That's <laughs> what you want. Just a very quick follow up on that. Um, right, I'm wondering if there's like any, uh, just building off the consent piece around a regular like annual check-in, because often if we download the first app or where we get that initial consent, but then life goes on. Some of us have children who occupy all of our mental bandwidth sure. and we forget that we've consented to that, but we might want to change that if we actually had a second to really think about it or what, or things change, right? Like there's each data, I don't know, all the, all the things that could happen. So is there anybody who does and either an annual or some sort of way for people to easily go back and either change or an annual check-in um, around consent. So banks are required to send an annual privacy notice. I'm pretty sure that's under Graham Leach Bliley, um, in which it shows you what they're sharing and what there isn't and how you can go about opting out. So there is a model for saying an annual notice has to go out. So that would be one, one place that could be modeled after. Okay. Um, okay, moving on to data broke. I just want to the, 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 um, the law enforcement exclusion piece, I know is referencing, you said quickly, another another law. Yes. Um, and I know that that's a you know, committee overlap issue, but I you know I do think that that's another area I would just flag up. I would think there's some more exploration around what does law enforcement necessarily need to collect for folks. We don't need to talk about it now, but I just, it would be sure. an interesting area for sure. me. Um, and and yeah. to note, we have, there is already a prohibition on uh, Vermont law enforcement from collecting facial recognition data uh, with a narrow carve out that was negotiated last year. So at least that part has already been addressed. Okay, so as you all know, we uh, introduced the nation's first data broker registry uh, back in 2018. Since then, uh, data broker registries have been adopted in California, uh, I believe Virginia, and there is a law in Delaware that seems to be making some progress which might go through. When we passed this law, we, we wanted to do something very light touch. We knew that we were wading into a brand new industry. We did not want to disrupt the industry. Uh, we, we, we certainly didn't want to do anything that um, you know, might cause someone to bring a lawsuit uh, that would invalidate the law. And we were, we were successful in all of those goals. Now that we have had four years of experience with that law on the data broker registry, and we've heard a lot of input, we think that it makes sense to make some uh, changes to the law. The first big one is that under the current law, we have a definition of data broker data breach. The idea behind that is that if you want to have a, if you have a data breach, it's only a data breach if a very specific subset of data is involved, PII which means your name or your first initial and last name and one of these types of data. Now, what that means is that if you want to collect 10,000 pieces of data on someone, but not their name, then you can't have a data breach. You might have their social security number, their date of birth and their address. You might have enough information such that anyone, anyone and there are data brokers out there that reconnect de-identified data with identities. It's, 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 uh, a, a non-trivial thing to get around the Data Breach Notification Act. In addition, although the, the data under PII is very sensitive, uh, it doesn't include things like address, phone number, date of birth, demographic information. There's a lot of information in short that could be lost about somebody and there would not be any duty to report, even though people might find that very sensitive. And data brokers specialize in collecting this specific information. Uh, to give you an example, one of the enforcement actions I, I, I worked on with a lot of other states was the Ashley Madison breach. That was a dating site tied uh, that was directed at people who were cheating on their spouses. Uh, their their, their uh, motto was, life is short, have an affair. Uh, and then they had a data breach 
off. And, and all of these people who were on this affair website, suddenly their data became public that they were on this affair website. Had credit card data not been involved in that breach, I don't think there would have been an obligation to notify about the breach, even though obviously this would be something that people would want to know about. So the idea behind the data broker breach was this was a much broader definition of PII, but limited to data brokers. It was basically defined as the same as our data broker, our data breach law, except take out data collector and put in data broker, take out PII and put in what we call brokered personal information, which is very broad. And what the law required was basically in the registry every year, data brokers had to list the number of data breaches they had in the previous year. I, I know of instances where companies um, had data breaches that we knew about and, and still put zero in the list. This goes to another issue with this, which is penalties for filing false information. There actually aren't any in the current law. Um, but I think it makes sense that if a data broker has a breach, they should have to notify the people just like anybody else. So that's the first kind of common sense uh, change here, uh, requiring data brokers who have a data breach to notify. And the notification process is similar to the process we have for other uh, entities. One thing that was removed from this was the opportunity to notify through substitute notice. So substitute notice is a company has a breach and it's either the cost to notify would be above $10,000 by any method, or they don't have people's addresses, which means they can notify public media and put something on their website and notify people that way. Okay? And I think that makes sense to have a substitute notice. However, if we're talking about data brokers, if, if, a data bro if XYZ Co has a data breach and loses your data, and then just puts out a notice that says XYZ Co had a breach, no one knows that XYZ Co had their data in the first place. So that notice isn't really useful. So this version would take away the idea of a substitute notice. Um, and I, I, if a broker comes in and says, well, wait, how would we know their addresses? We don't have that. I think the response will be, well, you're a data broker. Um, you know how to get people's addresses. That's literally the line of industry that you're in. Um, and if, if someone said that this is too burdensome, I think the response would be, look, you went into a business of collecting all these people's information and, and you had an obligation to protect it and you lost it. So who should be bearing the burden of that? It should be the people who had nothing to do with you, but you just lost their information to identity thieves and, and fraudsters or foreign governments, um, or should it be you? So that's the notion behind that. That's one big change. Then, this is a lot of language that basically um, does, we can jump to page seven now because the rest of it is all just the, the notification act. Okay. So, oh, let's right. skip something here. No, I don't think I did. Okay. So then under annual registration, one new requirement that we want to put in here is instead of telling people the, uh, the method for opt-out, if you offer an opt-out, this law would now require data brokers to provide a method for opt-out. Uh, we have been hurt, we have been told that that is the best practices of data brokers to provide people with a method for opt-out. We think that that should be simply required across the board. Um, and because of that, a lot of the language in the registration could come out because that was keyed to if, now that we know that you know, if, it, if it's a requirement, it just you have to say what the method is for opt-out. Um, another change is uh, taking out the actual knowledge requirement for having broker personal information of minors. If a data broker is collecting information, it should be their obligation to know that they have minors information uh, and, and, and to provide proper protections on that. Um, so the next part uh, at the bottom of page 7B1, we thought that if you're going to increase the obligations under this act, uh, it probably makes sense to increase the penalties because now there's a much stronger incentive not to register. If someone is not registered, it's much harder to 
you know, find out that they've been violating, you know, some of these laws. So one change is changing the civil penalty from $50 per day, not to exceed $10,000 per year, to $100 per day uh, flat penalty uh, for violation. Brian, you may have touched on this when I wasn't in the room, but have we, have, have we been able to um, actually apply a civil penalty to any data broker that we've identified that hadn't registered with the state? We have we have not been doing that. We have been suggesting that they register, and then they've you know been registering. Yeah, where where we found that, that was the case. Um, so the the ones that so the ones that you found notified them they've registered. They haven't. To my knowledge, yes. Yeah. So I, I so I suspect that if you you found out notified them and then they still don't register, that's at the point in time where you go after them. Right. Right. And that could be uh, that could even be you know included in the law. If you see under uh, C, um, another problem that we have is people omitting information, or data brokers omitting information, or putting in incorrect information. Um, for example, we asked for very specific information on how to do an opt out, and we said you shouldn't put just a link to a website, and a lot of companies did that anyway. So C says. Uh, on top of page eight, a data broker that omits required information from its registration must file an amendment to include the omitted information within five business days of notification of the omission and is liable for a thousand per day each day thereafter. So there's a right to cure. You, you didn't include this, you need to include it, otherwise there's a penalty. Um, then for filing false information, and we put in materially incorrect information. So I'm not trying to go after people because you know they, they did a typo or you know, anything like that. Uh, this is um, a single civil penalty of $25,000. Um, and then if it fails to correct the information, 1,000. So if they omitted something they should have included, they get a warning and then $1,000 per day after they don't correct it. If they put materially incorrect information, it's $25,000. And, and one of the things to really consider in terms of these penalties um, is just, and, and I think this may be part of, part of the issue with the uh, current penalty is, again, um, the office has limited resources and has to pick and choose you know, where they're going to apply them. So if you know, there is this, if it's something where there's you know, going to be like a $450 penalty, then, and someone else is doing something that could be, you know, twenty million dollars worth of penalties and restitution. You know, you kind of have to align the penalties with where you want the enforcement to be, and that's something that I was thinking about when I put this in here. Um, not that that's ever the the sole reason why anyone brings an issue, but I think that it, it is a factor that might uh, influence. Um, next is uh, a new section called data broker additional duties. So, individual opt out. So this is the uh, a consumer or their agent, that's important because some data brokers may say you have to notify us directly, which means if I want my 95 year old father opted out, then I have to tell him to file the opt out, which is probably not gonna happen. Uh, may do any of the following. Uh, request, stop collecting the consumer's data, delete all data, stop selling the consumer's data. Um, data brokers have to have a simple procedure to submit such a request and must comply within 10 days and they must clearly and conspicuously describe the opt-out procedure in its website. Another reason to make sure agents are included in there is because there are you know, market solutions to market problems. There are companies out there that will opt you out on your behalf, but if you can't assign this right to an agent, then they're not gonna be able to opt you out of, of data brokers in Vermont, which I think is important. You say may request. Yes. So, okay, I request you to do that, but what, what actually tells them that they have to do it. So that's A2. Okay. They, they um, must comply with the request within 10 days. Um, now, that's helpful, but to be perfectly honest, um, it's, it's, it's problematic because there are hundreds of data brokers out there. And the notion that anyone is gonna take the time to individually contact all of these data brokers and tell them to opt out, um, is 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 unlikely unless someone maybe you know doesn't have a, a day job um, or really really cares about privacy, um, and it also 
begs the question, you know, who should the onus be on here? Should people have to spend hours or days of their lives to, you know, go through all of these hoops to tell someone to stop surveilling them, basically? So that's where it's B, the general opt-out comes in. And I think this would be a very strong protection if uh, we enact it, which is um, a consumer or their agent may request that all data brokers registered with the state of Vermont honor an opt-out request by filing the request with the Secretary of State. So one-stop shop uh, opt-out of all data brokers. And this is another reason why, if you're going to put that in, it's important to up the penalties for not registering, because that's a huge incentive not to register with the uh, broker registry, right? Um, now, where this gets a little bit tricky is that uh, what, what you'll hear from, from data brokers very likely is that you know, if I'm John Smith at 100 Main Street and I contact a data broker and say, delete all your John Smith records, then they're going to be very concerned that they're deleting the right John Smith. Right? There may be another John Smith who wants their records to be in that you know, mailing list for whatever and doesn't want to be deleted. So then the question becomes, how do you provide enough information to make sure that they are the right person? Um, and this creates this privacy paradox where sometimes you have to give more information in order to uh, have your information removed. So the idea here is, this is a little bit of a punt, um, asking the Secretary of State to develop a method to facilitate this general opt-out. And the idea is you would provide the personal information to the Secretary of State's office, but not to each of these hundreds of data brokers. And there would be a way to facilitate the opt-out between the Secretary of State's office and the data brokers. This is loosely based on the national do not call list. You put your phone number in a list and they can't call that number. That's easy. The, the problem is you don't want a list of everyone's name and social security number, which anyone can look at. You know. So how to make that happen is going to be a little bit of a tricky one. Um, but I think it makes sense for the state to have that information and create a secure way that that can be communicated with the data brokers. Now, I put the Secretary of State in here because they're managing the registry. There are other ways that this could be done. Um, you know, the, um, the Department of Taxes has all the sensitive information about you that would be needed to do an opt-out. You could have a, 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 a square on a tax form that says, you know, by the way, opt me out of all data brokers. Now, I imagine that would have to go through a bunch of other things, <coughs> like overcomplicate things, and the Department of Taxes may have no interest in doing something like that. So, you know, that's just one idea. Another one might be the DMV. When you renew your license, there could be a checkbox, you know, that says, you know, opt out of all of the data brokers. Okay, so these are two; uh, those are just two areas where we kind of interact with uh, the state on a regular basis, uh, and and they have enough data to facilitate that without us having to provide more data. Right, they already have our data in their files, so you know, and they know who we are. Right, we have to identify ourselves to the DMV or the, the tax department. So, so that could be a different way to do it. Um, just remind me where where are these data brokers now registering? Is it with the Secretary of State's office? Yeah, it's the same database as like corporations. So we'd have to figure out whether or not the fees that are being charged would actually help pay for this mm. this system. Right. For the Secretary of State to to That's a clean this up. Yeah. Yeah. And the idea here is, and I, I think this is the same way that the uh, do not call registry works. Every 31 days, the data brokers would have to check that list and make sure that people are not, because the issue with uh, data brokers and same with do not call is that you might you know, flush your list of all of these numbers and then collect them again. So you need to kind of keep going back and making sure that you have, uh, uh, you know, the, the alternative is to you know, require each broker to maintain like a blacklist or a whitelist of people, but then they're still maintaining your information even though they're not supposed to, just to make sure that they don't accidentally collect your information again. So, you know, the exact technology of how to make that work is something that would need to be worked out, but I think it would be a very strong protection if we're able to implement it here in Vermont. This is similar to what we did a few years ago with insurance companies. There's a master death file okay. list that's out there that that I think the federal government puts out Social Security and, and they scour that um, to see if who's passed away. Um, we found that um, with insurance, the life insurance, they were 
they were doing that and, and paying it right away. But with annuities, mm. they could have a the annuitant. They were holding on to the. Oh. They weren't paying it out until somebody requested it. Oh, interesting. Um, so we made some changes there, but they have to scour that every so often as well. So I think I see a similarity in, in the thought here. Um, I mean, this, this sounds, this makes a lot of sense, but without knowing a lot about the, the da data industry, would this general opt out? I mean, if this caught on among states, wouldn't this more than anything really, really drastically change the entire data industry? I think it would have a huge impact. Yes, I, mean, I think that this this could be you know uh, a game changer in terms of that you know letting people opt out. Um, another another way that this could potentially end up evolving is I, I believe that there are you know market solutions there too with regard to the do not call registry. There are companies that serve mailing list companies and say we'll make sure that you don't have anybody on the do not call, so you don't have to check every thirty one days. We'll do it for you. So there could be companies that do the same thing here. Okay, basically a data broker that helps data brokers opt out. Of, you know. <laughs> um, <Very meta. laughs> New businesses. Yeah, I know. And I'm a development bill. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. very important. Uh, uh, next, we have the credentialing requirement, and uh, this credentialing requirement. Uh, again, we've been told that this was a best practice. Credentialing means. If you're going to sell information to someone, you have to make sure that they are who they say they are. Okay, there have been instances of data brokers selling information to fraudsters, or licensing information to fraudsters, um, and 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 the you know the, the the big companies say that they have lots of systems in place to make sure that doesn't happen. Under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, companies that provide credit reports have to credential whoever they give the information to. So this incorporates that uh, language. As a credentialing requirement for data brokers as well. Now, uh, and this you know comes out of the hearings and, and what we heard from a lot of folks. This individual opt out, general opt out, and credentialing uh, would not apply uh, to brokered inf uh, information that's regulated as a consumer report pursuant to the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Because the Fair Credit Reporting Act already has an opt out and a right to correct and a credit freeze credentialing. So basically, credit reporting agencies, with regard to their credit reports, would not have to worry about this stuff. Now, if they're also data brokers, which I believe a number of them are, they would have to comply with regard to that data. Okay, but this would not be on top of the uh, Fair Credit Reporting Act requirements. And then the last section is what I mentioned before, the uh, suggestion that we study the public information uh, exemption further. That, that is a walkthrough of the bill, and I'm happy to take any questions. Any other questions for Brian? So, this gives especially new committee members an idea of all the other things we do in commerce. <laughs> so it's really economic development work, <laughs> banking and insurance. Uh, but this is, I mean, a really interesting element. Consumer protection is, um, has been our strong point. Um, we've kind of taken a break over the last couple of years because of COVID, but um, I think next year it's time for us to get back into, into that realm again as well to make sure that Vermonters are protected. So um, we certainly will be um, getting something drafted, presenting, and having all the all the uh, people that are interested in this bill uh, in to discuss it and, and come out to a, hopefully a good place to maybe get this through next year. So. Um, without any questions, Ryan, thank you very much. Thank you for your service. Well, thank you, and we've appreciated having you on the committee over all the, all these years, and really uh, your knowledge of, of this subject has really helped the state. I appreciate that, and and I'll say that you know really my biggest regret about leaving the office and going to the FTC is that I will not be able to help this committee and your colleagues on the Senate side uh, work on this uh, next year, and I. Uh, I hope that uh, I hope that uh, you uh, end up putting something through that really creates those critical protections for Vermonters, and uh, we can again 
you know, be a leader in the country in terms of uh, privacy protection. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Wish you all the best and work for your service. Best wishes. Charity, thank you for coming in as well, and we'll stay in touch. And um, I don't know if this is the exact language that you, that you want to put in for next year, but we can talk about that yeah. in the session and maybe get a jump on drafting. Yes. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, Ledge Council didn't, you know, this was all Ryan put yeah. that together. So yeah. that would be wonderful. Okay. Good. Um, Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again, Ryan. Good luck.